As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Happy Palm Sunday, Palm Passion Sunday. This is a key moment in the liturgical calendar that actually ends Lent. Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, but it ends with Palm Sunday. Palm, as of 1970, Palm Passion Sunday. So the Holy Week, what we call Holy Week, begins right after today on Palm Sunday. And that's when we have the major events leading up to Jesus' death. Lenten, Lent, the Lenten meditations and, and readings are designed to kind of refresh us in the stories of Jesus. And now on Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, which is when we get the big events in, in Jesus' life, in the last week of his life. Uh, the, the readings for Palm Sunday, the Hillel, the last of the Hillel Psalms, uh, Psalm 118, Verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These are songs of ascent, so you're, you're supposed to read, you know, sing these while you're in motion. You're, you're moving. You're ascending, if you will. You, so you can be moving, marching, dancing, but the key is to, to move. And the Palm Sunday uh, uh, story is all about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and his, quote, quote triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We're going to come back at that a little later about how triumphant was it. So we have the, the, the last of the Hillel Psalms, 113 to 118. But the, the, the text that I want to, the, the passage I want to spend the time with, most time with today, is Mark 11. So let me just read you the, the 11 verses, which are the verses in the lectionary. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage, and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street, as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and other, others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, it's important for us um, in, in reading this passage and understanding it and the place of of Palm Sunday in the story of, of uh, the, the people of Israel, that time in Torah thinking, a sense of time in Judaism is not linear, but it's cyclic. When you remember, you re-dash member. You attach yourself to it, but in a whole new way. So when the, the celebrations, you experience the, the original story again, you enter it one way, but you leave a change. You leave a difference. So every year when you have this, this Passover, you, you enter it, you're entering the same story, but, and you're, re, you're remembering, but you're re-dash-membering because you're a whole new person and you get a whole new uh, meaning out of it and you come out of it uh, anew. Every cycle of time empowers us and changes us. 
It makes us fresh and new again. And that's what these, these celebrations, these festivals were. All of the Jewish festivals were times to gather together, but there were also what were called convocations of holiness or holy convocations. You have that phrase in Leviticus 23, 36, which really means a calling out, a, a summoning of the holiness out of you, of the, the sanctity out of you, a, a, a drawing out of, of your inner uh, sacredness and holiness. And that's the, that's the part of the re-membering of these, of these festivals. Three major festivals, your unique theological significance, you all know them, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is what we're talking about here, Passover, the Feast of Weeks, uh, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths, Sukkoth. But each one of these is a time of re-membering, so that the dismembered parts of you can be re-membered again to the, to the story. Um, as I said, as of 1970, the sixth Sunday in Lent is, is the, both the Palm Sunday of the Passion of our Lord. That's how it's technically called. And, and I love that, that they bring the Palm and the Passion together. Um, because the Palm is when you celebrate and you, you have festival and people are crying, Hosanna! And then... The, the Passover is when those same people, uh, it's the flip side. It's the flip side. The hail him people become quickly the nail him people. And it's just the flip side of Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday. Um, one minute, branches or halos in the air, bobbing over Jesus' head and carpeting his path. The next minute, those same branches are lashing his flesh and, and noosing your neck. And that's what will happen to any of us if we allow a celebrity culture to get to us. Um, if we judge uh, who we are ourselves, not by God's standards, but by the standards of the world and what the world is saying, because those hail hymns will become nail hymns very, very quickly. So you may want to to focus on that. You may want to do something else. I, I have a couple of things that I'm gonna kind of prime your pump with here. Um, the word crowd, as we got this hail him crowd, this Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Remember, it, it, it had resonance with glory to God in the highest. So we, we've got all sorts of acclaim for this, uh, this new Messiah that is that they see coming. Uh, the word crowd comes from the Latin terbs, T-U-R, turba, I'm T-U-R-B-A from which we get the words disturb and perturb. Okay, so um, the word mob comes from mobile, which means volatile and ever-changing. And these two backstories of this word crowd are more important than ever for an internet culture where we are count encountering um, a whole new version of the hail him, nail him. Um, mentality, the mob mentality, the crowd mentality on Twitter and online and on social, on social media. I, j the rabbis, just as just an aside here, and I, I would invite any of you who know exactly what this gesture was to please let me know. But the rabbis had a unique gesture that when they did this, it would immediately silence the crowd. Um, and it was kind of, and I'm not sure what it was. I think it was something like, or, you know, just a flick of the hand, but it meant quiet, please. And immediately the crowd would, would silence because of the respect for the rabbis. So the only thing that could bring the cloud, a crowd in Jesus' day to a quick stop and silence uh, was the, the flick of the, of the hand. And nobody knows exactly what this gesture was, at least I don't. Um, but it was a hand gesture that would immediately silence the crowd and they would honor um, the, the, the voice of the authority. Um, the power of crowds, the power of mobs. 
why do we go to sporting events? Why did our ancestors go to gladiator stadiums? Because we want to lose ourselves in a crowd. People love to lose themselves in a crowd, to be washed over by the waves of community. That's why I think we'll always have mega churches, the, the new camp meetings. I mean, we, we need to be with other people. I mean, kids need to know there's more than five other Christians out there. I mean, so you get together and, and experience this, this crowd. But to define yourselves by a crowd and to let the crowd uh, to set your thinking and, and mind your um, thinking. My, my favorite story of the dangers of crowd thinking, uh, I live on an island called Orcas Island. When we get off the ferry, we're in Anacortes. Anacortes is a, um, is very, is, as soon as you get off Anacortes, you're in Skagit County. It, it, the Skagit Valley is known for its tulips. I mean, we have monster tulip festivals here. We have huge attractions to tulips. I mean, you could, you could, there's a time of year where you can just look at a field and all you see are different colors of, of tulips, just carpeted with red, carpeted with green, carpeted with yellow. And these tulips are just everywhere. And one of the most strange incidents in history, all right, I'm just going to spend just a few minutes talking about this because it's so funny. And I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories from history is that, um, there was uh, the first bulbs that came uh, to Western Europe, Antwerp, came from Constantinople in 1562. And very quickly, a certain kind of charm and charism and cachet uh, engulfed this plant, this tulip plant. Everybody wanted a tulip. I don't get this. I don't understand this. Uh, in fact, I don't allow tulips on my property. That's a whole other story uh, that only Calvinists would understand. But people wanted one of the colors. And uh, the more rare the colors, the more expensive the bulbs became. And what it, be, what it was called was tulip mania or tulip mania. And all of Holland got caught up in this mob mentality. Everybody had to have uh, as many of the cornucopia of colors that tulips came in as they possibly could. By 1636, one bulb was going for, quote, a new carriage, two gray horses, and a complete harness. That's one bulb. Speculators got on the action, and bulbs would exchange owners while still in the ground. The stock exchanges of Europe started trading in bulbs. I'm talking about tulip bulbs. Charles Mackay, in his classic text on extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds, tells of a sailor who brought word from the Levant of a new shipment of bulbs. And the merchant, wanting to thank the sailor for the inside scoop, fed him a breakfast of red herring. The sailor saw what he thought was an onion on the table, that he soon went with his breakfast. Actually, the bulb was a Semper Augustus, worth some 3,000 florins, or in our money today, $50,000, one bulb. And when the merchant came back in the room, he watched the sailor was happily chomping on his hair and, and, and chewing the what he thought was an onion, but it was actually that tulip bulb that was worth $50,000. In McKay's words, nobles, citizens, farmers, merchants, seamen, fishermen, maidservants, even chimney sweeps, and old clothesmen, clothesmen dabbled in tulips. People of all grades converted their property to cash and invested in these flowers. The smallest bulb could leverage a large loan, and the whole of Holland and much of Western Europe started speculating in Holland, Holland's tulip markets as everyone became rich, but then the mob turned. In 1637... The bubble burst, or you might say the tulip tumbled. And no one knows why people started selling, but they did. It was over almost overnight. And one day you were enormously rich. The next day you were totally bankrupt, bereft, and a beggar. The banks failed, and the blaming and the recriminations began, and they all blamed the mob hysteria. As is common with crowd assessments, crowd judgments, crowd conclusions... They were wrong. You can't trust the crowd. Time and time again in Scripture, we find you can't trust the crowd. There's an old saying, put it to a vote, and they'll always vote to go back to Egypt. There is something about the anonymity of crowd decisions, the headlong, headstrong energy of the pack that makes wrong decisions seem so right. Bad choices seem so flawless. Cruel actions seem so sensible. 
when the crowd spoke in Scripture, they always, almost always, I mean, I'm still trying to find a right one, but they spoke wrong. The majority vote when it was taken was a big mistake. Adam and Eve, they were a majority. The building of the Tower of Babel. Noah, one man standing against the whole world, but the whole world voted and thought Noah wrong. The nine to one vote of Joseph's older brothers that resulted in his enslavement in Egypt. The golden calf thing with Aaron and the Israelites at the bottom of Mount Sinai was Moses was up top. Moses, Aaron was put in position by the majority. And, and but the majority made him do supposedly what he did. Joshua and Caleb's minority report, they were over, um, outvoted 10 to two. The majority ruled, ruled them wrong. Gideon stood in the minority in Judges 6 against the whole town, electing Saul as king, even though Samuel and God thought it was a bad idea. Absalom stole the hearts of the people and got the majority. Elijah versus the prophets of Baal in the context, in the contest at Mount Carmel. All the disciples fled and left the one man, Jesus, the most inexplicable and worst crowd decision ever made. The majority ruled and said, we want Barabbas. The crowd killed Jesus. A crowd mentality killed our Savior. If you can find a single majority vote in Scripture in which the majority voted right, please let me know. Majority rules. Majority may rule, but the minority is usually right. Now, there are other kinds of democracy other than majority rules democracy or mobocracy or direct democracy. There's deliberative democracy, which combines representation, participation. There's nonpartisan democracy. There is anticipatory democracy, parliamentary democracy. There is a lot of different kinds of. But Jesus, crucified by crowd thinking, crowd mentality, even goes further and critiques the whole way of, of thinking. An official gathering required to form a synagogue was at least seven. A special number for prayer, it's called a minyan, was 10. But Jesus says, forget that. Forget the seven. Forget the 10. We're two or three. Just two or three. Okay. The power's in the small numbers for Jesus. The power's not in the mob, in the, in the consensus. The power's in the, in the two or three, the critical mass. That's where the power is. And that, that's where we have today this strange symbol of the palms, the, the naming of Palm Sunday after the, the waving of the palms. You could write a lot of the story of the Bible from various branches. You know, you got the olive branch. Um, what did Noah look for when the dove brought it back? You, you've got the you got the almond branch, which is really what Aaron's rod is, is an almond branch in the Ark of the Covenant. Um, actually, the whole golden lampstand is an almond tree. Actually, the symbol of Judaism is the menorah, which is an abstract symbol of an almond tree. So the almond branch, but the palm branch is, is very important. Palm branches on the arms of a human or being waved by a human is a celebration symbol of victory and triumph. And um, it, it is a, uh, you find the palms in catacomb art even, the, these symbols of branches on the graves of the deceased symbolize the overcoming of death with life, with new life, the belief in the resurrection, the, the power of the, the spirit over the flesh. Um, and I, I love the, the uh, Jacopo. Uh, he, he's one of the, the most incredible uh, Tintoretto's uh, crucifixions come out of uh, Jacopo. And he, the, you can see him in Venice today. You go to these, these churches, but here's one of his famous crucifixion scenes, and, and I'll, I'll have it really so you can actually see it better. 
But the centerpiece of, of this, his most famous crucifixion scene is not Jesus on the cross. But if you look at the center, the dead center is right here. All right. But what is right there? A donkey that had been already used to put up Jesus upright, but now is putting up one of the one of the thieves. But he's got a palm branch in his mouth. And here's another one of Jacopo's uh, crucifixion scenes. But again, here's here's the three of them upright on the crosses. But right here in front of the cross is a palm frond. Right here. Um, so the power of the palms, a symbol of the palms, um, very important to, to our ancestors, and it should be very important to us. Now, the, the story of, the, of Palm Sunday, if you really want to get the backstory, I did my, one of my first vlogs for this, uh, vlog number one, two, or three, I forget which one it was, tells the backstory of the, of the palms, and where I really argue that the, the procession of the lamb should really be called the selection of the lamb the most perfect lamb, the Paschal lamb. But the, the power of the palm as a symbol of triumph and victory. But it's a victory that they were hailing as a political victory. But what, what Jacopo makes clear in these paintings is that, um, that it's a different kind of victory. It's a whole different kind of victory. It's the victory of the cross. It's a victory of suffering love. It's a victory of, of a love that was willing to lay down its life for the least and the last and the lost. Um, it's a victory that comes as Jesus set his face. Now, it, this is a phrase that's used of Jesus, has set his face towards Jerusalem. We think of it in terms of the ascension, but we need to think of it in terms of this too as well. He set his face as he's riding that donkey into, into Jerusalem. He's setting his face on what is coming. He knows what's coming. He's setting his face. And amidst all of the, the chaos and, and, and amidst all of this fake hail, 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 Hosanna, hallelujah, Hosanna, I mean, it's all of that. Um, what keeps him on an even keel? And what keeps him firmly committed to the will of his Father? When you're exercising, and part of exercise every day ought to be kind of exercising to, to improve your stability, your equilibrium, your what is called balance. What you do is you stand on one leg. And maybe even, you know, hop on one leg. Or you, but you stand, at least you stand on one leg. And one of the things that you will find is that when you are unbalanced and when you are uh, on one leg, you don't have both legs to stand on, there's one thing that really helps to maintain your equilibrium and your poise. And that is if you keep your eye on something fixed. And when you just fix, just attach your eye, just totally zoom in and say, I am not going to take my eyes off of this. No matter how woozy and wobbly I get, I am going to keep my eye right there. And if you do that, you will find that you will stabilize and you will actually find equanimity and equilibrium and equal poise on one leg if you keep your eye on something fixed. That's what Jesus did, and that's what you and I need to remind our people on Palm Sunday. Keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Never take our eyes off of Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on Him. No matter what life brings, no matter what chaos, no matter whether the crowds are hailing us, hail Him or nail Him, no matter what the crowds are saying, keep your eyes on Christ. That's the way to stability. That's the way to faithfulness. And that's the way to stand upright and walk forward. Keep your eyes, keep your mind on Jesus. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember it's more important you prepare the preacher and you prepare the sermon.